Welcome, everyone, to Ascendal Unscripted. It's great to have you here. I want to say hello to uh, all of our guests, attendees coming in from all over. It looks like as far as Canada and as close as New Hampshire. I'm Michael Cinquino. Today, I'm going to be moderating a conversation on bridging the product and tech divide. If you're not familiar with Ascendal, Ascendal is your strategic partner for accelerating software revenue. So I got to ask the CEO, Dave, uh, what, what does this mean? What does this actually mean? And what he was able to share with me is that it means it addresses issues from leadership vision to the delivery of software into the customer's hands. And the next question is, what does that cover? It covers everything from product strategy and design to architecture and development. That's a little bit about Ascendal. Now I'd like to introduce two Ascendal team members who are going to have it out, if you will, over today's topic. I was going to say in this corner uh, and first introduce Clint Edmondson. Clint is Director of Software Engineering and an expert in development strategy. He's a hands-on technical leader with a bias for action. Clint has been helping companies maximize the use of their technology for over 35 years working on everything from custom shrink wrap software at small startups to enterprise architecture and methodology adaptation at Fortune 500 companies. He is currently Director of Software Engineering at Ascendal Technology and lives in St. Louis, Missouri. Clint, I was going to say Missouri. Okay, all right. Uh, <laughs> not too far from there, we have Jason Ling. Jason is Director of Product Strategy, specializing in product management and alignment. Jason pioneered innovative digital experiences, including launching the first mobile social media network that set the modern standards. They established global product management processes, scaled teams across regions, and launched B2B2C marketplaces, acquiring millions of users. Jason has a proven track record of creating digital experiences that engage hundreds of millions of users across the web and mobile platforms, driving user engagement and business growth. Disney, News Corp, and Expedia are all on his resume. Gentlemen, welcome. Great to have you here. I'm uh, going to do a little preface here about what we're going to talk about, then we're going we're gonna to dive in. So uh, today's discussion is going to explore the tension in between product and engineering teams. But more importantly, we're going to look at what Ascendo likes to call the language in between. This is the unspoken assumptions, miscommunications, and misunderstandings that often occur between teams. And rolling us in, Clint, I'll, I'll ask you to weigh in first on our first question. And it's in many organizations, tension arises between product and tech teams. What does this divide typically look like from where you sit? Oh, man, I've seen it surface itself in a lot of ways. I mean, as simply as just lack of discussion, lack of conversation between members of the team to hostility, downright contempt. I've seen shouting matches. I've seen... <laughs> Uh, and those are our good days. No, I've seen teams teams that show up and it looks like you're at a funeral where nobody wants to speak up. Everybody's already feeling this this somber attitude. Um, but no, you know, it serves itself in a lot of different ways. Uh, almost always emotions. Mm -hmm. um, and that obviously has a trickle-down effect into the work product itself and ultimately the success of the project. Jason, I see you nodding. Is it a similar purview from where you, from where you sit, man? Yeah, why don't you just do the thing that we tell you that we want you to do? I mean, no. <laughs> and it, all the problems would be solved. Uh, no, it, it, it's exactly it. It's eventually what happens is, is that when you have that tension between two groups and and usually the the most animated of, of groups is usually the product team and the engineering team. It, it usually turn it usually ends up one of two negative ways. Unfortunately, it's either just total disdain for the other side or complete checkout like like you know, like clint says funeral i say zombies and and it's yeah and and then everybody loses so it's it's just that yeah so we've had um funeral and then one step beyond that a, a rebirth into zombies um <laughs> hey, so they, so they, we're getting there <laughs> yeah, we're getting there um so i guess the next question would be what drives this divide uh, what, what do you think is the catalyst for this kind of behavior? Jason, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I mean, simply, and, and this is such a broad brush, but simply it's communicating. 
or the lack thereof. And, and it's also, I would say another symptom of that is these groups feeling like they, they're not being heard. Like engineers feel like they're just being told, Hey, here's my vision, build it, do it. This is what we need to do. And then people on the product side on product managers, they hear from engineering. Well, no, we're not going to do that. And it's like, well, well, why not? Because what you want us to do doesn't make sense. And it's just this massive misalignment that happens. And that that's the cause. It's like they don't see the vision. Like if you look at product managers, product managers sole job is to convince everybody in the organization that their vision makes sense and it's good for the organization. And I will and I will pick on my own people. If they're bad at narrating that, it's it, that's what starts that avalanche. Cause because then it's the like, well, what do you mean by that? Well, why that? Well, that doesn't make sense and everything like that. And then that frustration builds because it's the look of like your engineering, your job is just just build it. Like just just build it. Yeah. So mm. I mean that's that's what I've seen for a while. <laughs> Clint, how about you? Yeah, I Two mean, more things. Communication is certainly the key to it at the end of the day, right? We've got product folks speaking business language coming in and talking to engineers who speak technical language on a day to day basis. They spend most of their day talking to a computer and then they have to come and talk to an adult and, you know, a, a human talking about business stuff. And like, I don't, we don't, we don't want to deal with that. We want to talk about bits and bytes and, and the peaks and pokes. So, uh, getting, the teams to talk the same language and in, in our terms, we call it a ubiquitous language that everyone shares and they can understand getting on the same page, getting expectations set about what needs to be built versus engineers are typically asked, how long is it going to take? And if that communication has any kind of gap, you might not get what you need to know to give an accurate estimate. And it turns back around and like, we don't trust you because your estimates are wrong. So mm -hmm. I feel like we have a little bit of time to dig a little bit deeper on this. So, uh, you've talked about the the what you've talked about the why. Um, as far as remedies to address this language divide between product and tech, um, mm -hmm. what have you seen work? You've both laid out a couple of things. Um, I know timing has something to do with it, but I guess that maybe starting from a high level, Clint. Um, what are some remedies to address the language divide in in your purview? Yeah. So first we start with lots and lots of therapy that tends to come into play <laughs> in the context yeah. that we're trying to help a team out or we're trying to help a, a company out and get to get better, to get past some sticking points is what I would call it. You know, clearly companies ship software every day, so it's it's not ruining our, our lives, but getting them over these humps where they're not quite getting a line, they're not quite getting there. So it starts with understanding positions and emotions and where they're at. And then looking at, you know, I, I look at a Venn diagram of people, process, and tools, right? The, those are all the ingredients it takes to, to build a product these days. And starting to look at where is the breakdown? Is it the people? Are they just do not have the tools they need to effectively communicate? Are they not meeting regularly, which is a process thing, which, you know, getting on a cadence? Or do they lack the tools to, to see their output and to see their, their, their work products come together? So, uh, it, you know, classic consulting answer, it depends. But it comes down to what what is the nature of the dysfunction? And one of the great things I learned in, in some coaching and therapy I've had is happy families tend to be happy in the same ways. It's dysfunctional families tend to be dysfunctional in all kinds of crazy ways. Mm. So you have to look at where, what is that particular pain? What is that thorn in their paw that we need to address and start to, to work on that and then work towards more of a holistic look at how can we have all those, those three parts of that Venn diagram come together? One of the things, Jason, that came up when I was thinking here, listening to Clint, was um, it sounds like like communication is not necessarily seen as part of the process. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not; it's almost an after, it's an after, an afterthought sometimes. But but and it doesn't sound like it's bad will. It doesn't sound like people are trying to screw themselves up. But it doesn't sound like it's it's usually part of the equation. Is that accurate? Yeah, I I would say it's. I wouldn't call it an afterthought. I would I would I would use the term assumed. Which, which makes it even worse that it's assumed that that people are talking to each other and and what and in my pa uh, in my past where I've and you know I've oversung global product people in like multiple countries and multiple product lines and everything like that Clint I know Clint has done the same thing as well the thing that I have always found to be fairly successful is again it's I think that 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 in between language I will call it the connective language mm -hmm. is is the understanding of the vision. 
I, that's what I feel that that is, that's actually like, and how you do that is you get people exposed to that vision as early and as often as possible. Um, specific example from my startup days, I'd come up with a wacky idea for, for one of our products. I would literally pull UI UX people into a room, product people into a room and engineers into a room. And we're drawing squares on a whiteboard. And it's like, it's from that, that like day zero of like, this is what we're trying to do. And like I said, I'm only going to speak from the product side of it. So, yeah. but it's the, like, it's now my job to convince all y'all. Like I need to convince Clint, not what, just what we're doing, but why we're doing it and why yeah. it matters. And most importantly, how you in engineering fit into the equation yeah. instead yeah. of just like, Oh, I spent the last six weeks coming up with something with you, with the UI, UI, UX people and other product people in marketing. And then I'm just going to call you into a room, throw something at you and be like, so, uh, you got six months go. Like, that's a no. great point. Let me jump in. So yeah. I, I give you the perfect example of where I've seen that. Uh, and it speaks to process. Somebody thought, oh, we'll, we'll implement an agile process and we'll set up a regular cadence of meetings and the teams will be aligned. This particular team I worked with, the only time the product owner and the, the, the technical lead talked to each other were in those meetings, which only happened a couple of times a week or over the period of two weeks, four or five times. You can't expect that the process would solve the gap in communication. Like you guys should be talking all the time. This is just a, this is just a place to make sure that we didn't miss something. And that's a that's something you can only see from the outside as an observer. Like these guys are only talking, and you see it by the language Jason just said. Like they come in with this this set of, of words and assumptions and things that they bring to that meeting, assuming the other party has heard it all and has been coming along for the ride, which they haven't. They've been busy doing something else. They come in and this is the first time they've heard of it and they don't have the context to understand exactly what the ask is. So yeah, it's mm. very, very prevalent. So can I ask about a question about modalities of communication from, from both of you? So Jason, you, you laid out, you know, getting in the room. I think you even said that, getting in the room together and beginning. I, I, you know, we've got in the room, we've got video conferencing, we've got Slack, it's used a lot. Can I ask both your thoughts on modalities of communication? Because being in an organization, sometimes the question is, well, is this a Slack message, a phone call or a meeting? You know, like, could, could this yeah. meeting, could this meeting have been just an angry text? You know, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. And then vice versa, should this text right. have been a phone call? Right, right. Right. Because it's you, you get no tone over text. So and, right. and sometimes it's a lot faster to have a three minute phone call than it is a, you know, 30 email exchange. So in, in your view, you know, we're going to get to, you know, specifics on the language of in between and how to bridge the gap. But could you just both weigh in on, on um, modality of communication and your, your thoughts and experience with that? I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, a consultant slash product answer. It, it literally depends. Like the way that yeah. I've always seen it that has been successful is it's like you can't force it. Because each group is going to, it's like, it's almost kind of this whole, I don't want to say self-governing because sometimes if you have a self-govern, if you implement self-governing on a, on a team and you don't have any structure or any vision or anything, it's just, you know, Mad Max, it's terrible, but it's like, there, there are certain ways that certain groups kind of communicate. It's like, you can't force a culture to go back to what Clint was saying. It's like, if you just start throwing tools at it, that's not going to solve your problem. What you want to do is you want to instill the whole thing of like, okay, here's how we, here's how we expect to do things like case in point. I'll use, I'll use a personal one that we, we use here at, at Ascendal. Every time I get off of a call with a potential client, I drop my notes in our Slack channel and tag certain people. And that works in the past. It would have been an email. It would have been something it's like, you really need to think about right. of the, it's, it's again, like it's <laughs> consultants are sort of like, well, it depends. Um, it's like, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to convey? Like, how is that? Like, to your point, it may be a whole thing of like, no, I'm just going to drop a zoom link in a, in a chat room going like, let's, let's talk. Or it might be, it's going to be five sentences or it's going to be this. It's, I think it's a little more, or it's, it's definitely more organic than that and that has to do with how do the people around you how do they digest that information in the most efficient way so it how about you? <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i think but it's I, all around my interruption but i think yeah jason i think the, the picture you painted in the beginning and you know pardon my reference but it, it's it's how i think it, it sounds like 
folks need to know that they're in the same movie and they're making the same movie and they need to know what roles they are. And a lot of times the movie starts getting made and nobody really is totally understanding that we're telling one story versus another versus this role versus your my role. So it sounds like getting folks in the room, at least on the front end, could be a possible way to kick things off, like in a physical space in real time. So you would agree with that? Okay. Okay. Um, and we're making the same movie. Clint. Yeah, I was going to jump in. Be. So I think it's multimodal. I don't think it depends. I think it's all of the above. I think cultures tend to, to evolve into certain modes of communication as their standard. We're certainly Slack driven. I think even in a meeting this past week, I said, we manage by Slack. I like, interesting. I hope, I hope that's not all we manage by, but that is certainly a, a predominant mode of communication. I think as a leader, I'm looking at, across these different lines of communication and I'm trying to see where they're breaking down. So imagine I need a quick answer, a Slack message, yes or no, binary, you know, one, two, three, four, five choice answer, fine. If you start to see a novel emerge in a Slack thread or you start to see where two people aren't, where the conversation isn't congealing towards an answer, that's when as a leader, I tend to lean in and say, should we jump on a call, right? And, perfect world, every one of us should be smart enough to recognize that on our own, but we're usually so caught up in our work that communication is a side quest for us, right? So if you get busy, you tend to forget that there are other humans on the other side of that conversation. You just need your answer and you need it quickly. But if we want to be effective, we have to recognize when we're not being effective, if that makes sense. And yeah, particularly um, you use paths of, of broader communication or even escalation, right? There's nothing wrong with pinging your boss to say, hey, I need your help getting a decision on this because I'm not getting through. Um, so audience, uh, echoing Diana in the chat, uh, if you're an audience member and you have a question for Clint or Jason, uh, please feel free to chat it and we'll take a look at that. Um, remedies. Um, you know, going back a second, hold on, because uh, I forget, I think it was Clint said, all good places look the same, all all all. Uh, dysfunctional families family look, look different. So, so, I, so before we oh. go into the dysfunction or how to correct it, could you, uh, could you share if, if all, you know, good families, <laughs> non-dysfunctional look certain way, what are some of the traits of, of when it is working? What are some of the traits to strive for? Yeah. I mean, it's happiness. It's teams that are energized teams that can meet quickly and exchange information. And they both leave, both parties leave satisfied. It's, I don't know, it's just this feeling that we're moving and everybody's in sync. It's 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 hard to describe in words, but it's easy to see in practice when a team is gelling. Right? It's it's a state of flow, if if you want to think of it that way, right? We've we've all been in flow individually at times in our lives when we're working on something we're really engrossed in and we're really feeling it and we're really passionate about it. Teams and entire organizations can get into a state of flow if the conditions are set up right and the the, the people participating are really um you know, they're skilled and they're, they're conscious of it. Yeah. I would say in my experience, it, it's they, they, being heard. That's a huge, huge thing for like a really well functioning group. The individuals in that group truly feel like they're being heard. Jason, Jason how, how do you, do you know? know? Um, it's engagement. You know, it's like you can absolutely tell, like, I'll pick on engineering real quick. If an engineer doesn't feel like they're being heard, they're not <laughs> going to say a damn thing during a meeting. They're just mm -hmm. going to be sit there. They're going to, like I said, it's, it's going to be, they're going to be a zombie. And from a product perspective, a product manager, a product leader, whoever you want to call it, if we don't feel like we're being heard, the frustration goes to 11 almost instantly because... Then it's like, well, if you're not listening to me, then why am I even here? And yeah. it, it's it's pretty it, it happens pretty quick. But again, uh, being heard and also to to the point of like everyone knows what their their role is to use the Michael use your movie thing. Everyone knows which part they're playing, and as long as they know, okay, like this is what I'm accountable for. This is what I have the authority to do. In some instances, this is the autonomy that I'm given to do the two things that I need to do. And if I'm being heard, then it all kind of like gels together. Like to Clint's point, it's like you just kind of see it. Like, because everyone's like, cool, I know what I need to do. I know what I own. I know what I support. If I, if I raise my hand in a meeting going like, hey, I got some questions, it's not just going to be like 
brushed off, it it's a it's a big impact. They're happy. Yeah, <laughs> they they're, enjoy they're, working they're, with they're each invested. other. They're invested. I mean, they're invested. They actually care. Yeah. So it sounds like it sounds like a measurement of sentiment, in a way. If, if sentiment is. is good, you know that communication likely is also good. If sentiment is not good, likely the the opposite is true. So you know there, there are and there are tools out there to actually measure sentiment on calls. Avoma is is one of them. It's a it's a great tool that we use. Um, yeah. So if we looked at that, you know, sentiment is good. I know there's a, a it, it really depends organizationally and and from team to team. But are there some predominant traits that might tip a team off? Uh, other than not being happy or not having positive sentiment, it might go, you know what, I think we need to communicate maybe in a different way or maybe change the frequency of communication. What does that look like? I mean, I'll, I'll pull it and I'll, I'll do an engineer velocity. If you're yeah. just not like if you are not, if things are just dragging and things are taking long and and also if you find yourself having it's like, wow, we're in a lot of meetings like what's up with that? You know, that kind of thing. I mean, there are signs. I mean, yeah, it's, it's the antithesis you know. of flow, right? There yeah, are exactly. things aren't getting done. People are, are complaining more, the unrest, the, the lack of coordination, right? It, it, it's contempt. I mean, it, it starts small and it grows and grows and grows to the point where you have almost a poisonous, potentially toxic environment. And that's, like I said, on some extremes, I've seen that where they literally, the, the only times the product and tech got together was for scheduled meetings and they yelled at each other the whole time like it was flatlined for years so i mean mm. i mean i personally <laughs> would rather see an or i mean this is going to sound bad but it's like i would rather see an organization with high turnover than just toxic you know zombie funeral environment kind of thing because yeah. that's yeah. worse like, cause that's just like, we just don't care anymore and it has a material impact on what you're trying to do yeah and Michael, like you mentioned, sorry, but, Michael, you mentioned that there's, there's tools that can, can spot that. We've got one right here. I mean, I joined a meeting. You can tell by the tone of voice or the caliber of communication, whether or not teams are truly getting along and gelling. It, it only takes 10, 15 minutes most of the time. If it's a team that's got a lot of work, maybe a couple of meetings to really see it, but it does not take long to start to see those symptoms. It, it sounds like it, and it's got to start right on the front end, because the picture that you both painted is that if someone doesn't feel in that very first meeting that they can speak up and be heard, then they're going to bite their tongue. And then again, again, and again, and then it's going to walk into what you both have laid out where teams don't want to talk to each other. And when they do, they're not talking, they're yelling. So it sounds like the communication, this language in between is really critical to be established on the front end of a cycle. Is, is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, product. Our like I said, like I said earlier, our job is is to convey the vision and to get buy in from across the board, and we can't do that yeah. if if we're just terrible communicators and we're we're looking our looking down our nose at at the other groups and everything like that. Because you know, I will say something complimentary to to Clint and the engineer. So, and it's on record. Yeah. I've always looked at engineering keeps product honest. Great. Um, I'm going to, part of my interruption, I saw a couple of questions come in. Joe has a question. It says, how do you account for cultural differences on distributed teams? Great question. I'll bite. I'll bite. So you bite. Cause that's really more that I've seen it more in engineering than product, honestly. Yeah. So, you know, I don't have an expertise in anthropology, but every time you form a team, you're forming a unique culture, or a unique group to achieve an output or an outcome. They have to take their respective cultures they're coming from, but they also have to merge and become a culture in of themselves if they're going to be a cohesive team. That has to happen. If that cultural divide from where they came from, and I mean, this, and this isn't, you know, this manifests itself in a lot of different ways. I've seen like, well, in our old company, we always did this. I'm like, well, you're not there anymore. You're now with this group. So how can we get to a new normal? So the classic five dysfunctions of a team and the, the journey that a team has to go through to get to get past those, to get to functioning, like those are also a thing you can very co consciously see and cognitively work towards in coaching a team to get through that. So, I want to dive in. Sorry, We're running out of time. Part of my interruption because this is a great one and, and one that I really wanted to get in. So, um, how, how do you handle someone who won't engage communication wise? Because we all have our, our own kind of communication strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, what have either of you done in the past to to really get someone out of their shell or engage someone who just won't engage? 
I ask why, honestly, mm. it's like, why, like what, why, why? Cause it's, cause it's, it, you know, individuals are individuals and cause they are like there, there could be a myriad number of reasons of why they're not engaging. And, and the first step to, to diagnosing the problem is ask why, what's going on? Why do you feel like you can't engage? And then you go from there. And that's what I've done in the past and it's worked. Clint, how like, about you? Counseling and therapy. I mean, I, I think it should be required learning for every leader to get at least a foundation because it is, you, you're, you're looking at the intrinsic motivation of people. And if something is breaking that motivation, you're going to see it and it needs to be addressed, right? If they may, they may not be the right role. They might be in a position where they've, especially in companies that move as fast as we do these days, if they've role transitioned to a point where they're not in their skill set or their comfort zone, but yeah, I completely agree. What, what, what's the bottom of this and how can mm -hmm. I help you? Right. We have a tool called Right People, Right Seat, where we ask a series of questions like, is this, are you in the right role? Are you feeling your skills are being used? Are you feeling like you can add value and contribute? Right. Mm. Uh, and if some of those answers are no, then maybe there's a different role they can play, right? It doesn't mean you get rid of someone necessarily, but maybe that we can shape the, the environment to be in a place where you can be more productive. Got it. There's, um, well, I'm going to take one more question from the audience, and then mm -hmm. I would love to hear some parting thoughts from the both of you. So from Liz, mm -hmm. Liz says, I'd love to hear more about how the collaboration of the team is reflected mm -hmm. in the end product. If you had a mm -hmm. wager a guess, what indicators do you see in products and solution of teams that work well? What a great question. Mm. You want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you want to go first? Uh, when teams work well the product's quality is superior right it uh you know how many times you've ever looked at a piece of software and one screen looks different in tone and style than the other one or functions a little bit differently that's a group where the design and the, the ask and the delivery wasn't necessarily the same yeah. or it's been fractionalized right yeah my partner constantly says when, when using any type of software, be like, what was this designed by an engineer and it, and oh, yeah. you could just tell and, and, yeah. but also vice versa, you know, not to bag on it, not to bag on it too hard, but it's like, you can yeah. also tell like if, if it's like, oh, wow, this is really complicated because someone on the product right. UI UX side just decided to go nuts. And it's like, right. but it doesn't like, what is this? Yeah. It's, it's yeah, I mean, pretty clear. Yeah. 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 It, it's the classic. <laughs> Is this, is this side not side talking to that side? You right. can see it. it. It's evident in the way things manifest themselves in the user interface and the functional back end. Like you can, you can just feel it. Could you put your finger on it if you were, you were asked to? Not necessarily, but it just it it, it manifests itself. Yeah, brilliant. So we're almost at wrap time, and before we go, like as we wrap, what should someone do as they leave this session? Like, what's the first act actionable insight? From each you maybe 30 seconds each uh um, sure clint we'll start with you so what, what's the one yeah. takeaway go do this now uh i don't know if i have one but i have what jason said at the very beginning which is a shared vision you establish that shared vision and you frequently keep that aligned i don't think you can just do it one time and then you know talking about the divide like okay we met i shared you my vision i threw a bunch of requirements over the wall i'll come visit you in three months and see how it's going that alignment has to be continuous and part of that is the communication that has to be had to do that effectively. So as a leader, modeling and fostering high value communication is incredibly powerful because sometimes teams can't figure that out on their own. They get stuck or they just simply lack the, the experience or, or the past examples to know how to do it well. So helping them through that and teaching them and guiding them. It's a true spirit of a leader, in my opinion. Hmm. Jason, parting part thought? I, I just something really, really simplistic. Uh, you should ask every single person in your organization, what are we trying to do and what is your part in it? Ask them that and see what answer you get. Cause that's going to, that's going to speak volumes. And if yeah. it, and if it doesn't make sense, you got a problem. <laughs> yeah. And if you get I... five different answers from five different people, you've got a big problem. Jason, what yeah. do you think the best modality is to ask that question? I know it's not, probably not an A, B, this one or that one kind of thing, but is, do you feel that like there's a modality, a sit down? Yeah, you know, I wouldn't, I would, I would, I, I would not do it over Slack or email. If you're a distributed <laughs> company, get on zoom face to face talk. If you're in, if you're in physical, get into a room, honestly, like that's what you do. I'll piggyback on that one final thought. I don't consider a senior engineer senior because they're really good technically. I consider senior engineer senior because they understand the business problem they're trying to solve 
and can solve it effectively. That makes you a senior, in my opinion. Mm. I'm pulling up a slide here. Um, I would love some help sure. from the audience to let me know if you can see the slide I have up on the screen right now. You should be able to see uh, a connect. Let's see here. Uh, yep, you can see it. Fantastic. Uh, so, um, so here's the thing. As mentioned earlier in in the uh, in the session here. Um, principles always apply. So there's this language in between always apply, but actually how to apply them can be challenging. And, and of course is very unique organizationally. And then also from a time and space perspective, just because things were working well a little while ago, doesn't mean in this time and space now, this is as easy to implement. So what we wanna be able to help you to do is give you 15 minutes to implement these practices in your particular organization at this particular space and time. So there's a couple ways, uh, there's just a few slots open for uh, Clint or Jason. So a couple things you can do, you can grab your phone and scan the QR code, go right to the calendar, book something right now, recommend that. Uh, if you're on the run, uh, there's gonna be a, an email coming out uh, with this, uh, the scheduling links, um, or screenshot this if you need to send it to uh, a member of your organization. Uh, but this is a, a really great opportunity to take what was uh, laid out today, to take this language in between and get some insight from Clint or Jason on what's going on in your particular organization. Because as mentioned, everybody's different. Everybody is bespoke. There's no one size fits all. Again, while there is a language in between, how that's implemented can be quite challenging. So uh, I'd say take, please take advantage of the opportunity. The team would love to hear from you. Again, you could scan the QR code here with your phone, screenshot this or emails will be coming forthcoming if you're on the run. So I wanna thank everybody, our audience especially, for tuning in, offering us some questions. The uh, next Ascendal Unscripted will take place live on October 10th. We're gonna be talking to CEO Dave Todaro about why your software development Actually, should I should I give that away? Why you're <laughs> we're going to be talking about why your software development organization can't get stuff done and what to do about it. So, looking forward to seeing everybody on ten ten. Uh, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Clint, uh, for your insight and your time today. Thank you, everybody. Please join us on October tenth. Go over to LinkedIn and follow Ascendal. Uh, on social media. There's lots of updates there. Again, if you know somebody that needs uh, to hear this or what's been talked about on this session, uh, email will be forthcoming or screenshot this. Feel free to forward it along. Again, or go over to LinkedIn. We're going to be uh, likely posting. You want to post up on this uh, so you'll be able to forward to anybody that you know needs to hear this message but might not, might not have been here in the webinar. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll uh, see you on the next episode.